The subcommittee will come to order. I'm going to apologize for being a little late. Thank you, for, uh, Mr. Chairman, for uh, being here. Uh, I'd like to welcome our witness, Mr. Rostin Benham, Chairman of the Commodities Future Trading Commission, to review the fiscal year 24 CFTC budget request. The CFTC is requesting $411 million for FY24, which is an increase of $46 million, or 12.6 percent, over the FY23 enacted level. The request includes a $12.7 million increase for personnel compensation and benefits, as well as a $30.9 million increase primarily within the divisions of data and administration for IT services, in particular from migration of data from legacy systems to cloud services. It's important to note that from FY22 to 23, the agency received a $47 million increase in baseline funding and grew from 676 to 759 employees. And this budget is seeking yet another $46 million increase. The CBO's most recent outlook shows that this administration has done more to increase our national debt than any other administration. The out-of-control spending has to stop, and there must be an expectation going forward for agencies across the federal government, including the CFTC, to improve efficiencies, root out waste, and focus on core functions without adding to the deficit. The failure of the Silicon Valley Bank and the current unrest in the banking sector highlight the importance of our financial regulators not being asleep at the wheel, not diverting limited resources and attention toward activities not critical to their core missions. I am concerned about the CFTC shifting focus to climate, diversity and equity, and other activities outside the bounds of the agency's fundamental job of ensuring healthy, functioning derivative markets. The CFTC continues to face new challenges and opportunities each year as evolving technologies and new market participants change the landscape of swaps, futures, and the options markets. Especially given the rapid expansion of cryptocurrencies and other digital assets, I expect oversight of these markets to be an important topic in today's hearing. The fraud and manipulation that occurred at FTX trading, which cost investors billions of dollars, highlighted the CFTC's limited oversight authority over cryptocurrencies. The CFTC does have regulatory authority over cryptocurrencies tied to derivative markets and, and in responding to fraud and manipulation that has already occurred. However, the lack of guardrails on spot markets leaves consumers who invest in these digital assets largely unprotected. The reactionary nature of CFTC's authority to respond only when wrongdoing, wrongdoing has already occurred and is often too late to help victims of fraudulent schemes. But as the CFTC faces these new challenges, the agency must not lose focus on its roots that grew out of the agriculture sector. The liquidity, transparency, and integrity of derivative markets is critical for the farmers in my district and ranchers to hedge risk and ensure accurate price discovery. For example, in my district, poultry producers manage the price risks of feed and other input costs through the futures markets regulated by the CFTC. While the CFTC plays an important role in ensuring the integrity of derivative markets, the American people deserve to know each federal agency as being a responsible steward of their tax dollars. So I look forward to exploring the budget proposal and the CFTC's work in more depth today. I'd also like to remind everyone we will abide by the five-minute rule for questions. Please make sure to push the talk button on your microphone before and after speaking. Uh, I'll also say that uh, votes, I think, might be scheduled in the middle of this hearing, so we might be having a little recess for you, Mr. Benham, uh, but we'll see. And I'd like now to recognize my colleague, Mr. Bishop, for his opening remarks. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Chairman Benham, uh, for appearing before us today to testify on the FY24 budget for the Commodities Future Trading Commission. <clears throat> The CFTC is trusted to oversee U.S. derivatives markets that American agricultural producers rely on uh, to manage their financial risk amid increasingly volatile economic times, uh, from the Russian invasion of Ukraine to severe global weather conditions. American farmers face an array of market and supply chain challenges when it comes to selling their products at home and abroad. Uh, it's as important now as it was after the 2008 financial crisis to ensure that financial markets in the United States operate with transparency and integrity, and CFTC is at the front line in that effort. Uh, the CFTC is a steward of both American markets and American taxpayers' dollars. With one of the smaller budgets among independent agencies, the CFTC is responsible for regulating a massive financial market, 
In June 2022, the Bank for International Settlements estimated that global derivatives markets had a $632 trillion national value. That is trillion with a T, while CFTC received a total of $365 million in FY23 appropriations. Uh, the CFTC is the only U.S. financial regulator that does not impose user fees on market participants, which further demonstrates the huge return that the American people get on their investment from your agency. CFTC is also responsible for regulating cryptocurrency derivatives and enforcing anti-fraud and manipulation rules in digital asset cash markets. Uh, while Congress works to build out the framework for the brave new world of digital assets in the United States, the CFTC has successfully uh, worked to create guardrails uh, in the derivative space that you already oversee. Uh, with all the recent turmoil in both the banking sector and digital asset markets, I'm pleased to note that when the crypto firm FTX collapsed, the, FT the CFTC registered and regulated derivatives trading platform was one of the few remaining survivors of that fallout. I look forward to hearing how the CFTC delivers for the American farmers, ranchers, and agricultural producers about the work the agency is doing to ensure resilient markets and about the progress the commission is making to promote diversity at one of our country's most valuable institutions. But most importantly and urgently, I'd like to get from you feedback on how your agency would be impacted by what we hear are uh, proposals uh, by the Republican side to uh, revert back to the uh, FY22 budget levels. Uh, I think back in FY22, uh, it included a one-time no-year appropriation for the agency to relocate its headquarters uh, to a GSA-owned facility separate from the other accounts. And I would have to presume that uh, uh, that would not be included in the, uh, uh, the cost, uh, I'm sorry, in the, in the budget that would be uh, yielded for the FY22. So I am uh, interested to hear from you uh, on top of uh, telling us about what your agency does as to how uh, the agency would be restrained or how it would function if, in fact, you have a 22 percent uh, cut in your budget, as some have proposed from the other side, or if you revert to the FY22 levels uh, minus the, uh, uh, the cost for the move. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Ranking Member Bishop. I'd now like to recognize Chairman Benham for his opening statement. Without objection, your full written testimony will be entered into the record. Thank you, Chairman Harris, Ranking Member Bishop, and members of the subcommittee. Appreciate the opportunity to testify on the President's fiscal year 2024 budget request for the CFTC. For over a century, the derivatives markets have played an integral role in the U.S. economy, facilitating risk management and price discovery, and contributing to financial stability and price predictability that impact the daily lives of all Americans including our nation's farmers and ranchers. Over the past three years, the world has experienced economic pressures from a global pandemic, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and extreme weather conditions, all of which led to record volatility for essential commodities. Our market structures, regulations, and thoughtful yet assertive approach to oversight have served the American people and markets as intended. Farmers and ranchers continue to be able to manage price risk during planting season, by locking in prices to protect against price fluctuations between planting and harvest. Large manufacturers, pension funds, and other commercial end users who need to manage for currency, interest rate, and other risks as they sell American-made goods across the globe are also able to rely on the derivatives markets. It has been almost 13 years since the Dodd-Frank Act expanded the CFTC's authority. In that time, derivatives markets have experienced massive growth. In addition, we have seen the industry's population shifting from roots in the financial markets to being significantly influenced by the technology sector. A growing number of retail participants are entering the markets, enabled by mobile phone technology and an endless stream of information to pursue opportunities with minimal barriers to entry. 
exchanges, intermediaries, and innovators who are eager to meet demand for products and services are proposing increasingly non-traditional models that demand our thorough, transparent engagement to determine compliance with our statute and regulations. Lastly, and perhaps most critically, cyber risk has emerged as a top risk to the agency. The persons and entities we regulate and the third-party service providers who support the derivatives ecosystem. The Commission requests a total of $411 million. This is a 12.6% increase above the FY 2023 enacted budget and is scaled to permit the Commission to maintain and enhance its oversight and enforcement function over the U.S. derivatives markets. The Commission has requested resources to protect the public and preserve market integrity by detecting, investigating, and prosecuting violations of the CEA and CFTC regulations. In FY22 alone, the CFTC obtained orders imposing over $2.5 billion in restitution, disgorgement, and civil monetary penalties, either through settlement or litigation, nearly eight times the total of our FY22 appropriation. The CFTC has risen to the challenges brought on by the burgeoning digital asset market by ensuring that the markets and market participants acting within its jurisdiction comply with their statutory and regulatory requirements. Despite a lack of direct regulatory and surveillance authority for digital commodities in an underlying cash market, to date, the Commission has brought 71 enforcement actions involving digital asset commodities. Such cases compromise more than 20% of the 82 actions filed last fiscal year. The FY 2024 budget requests also continues the agency's commitment to maintaining the integrity of the markets, particularly with the recent expansion of direct retail participation in the derivatives markets and in underlying commodity markets, such as those for digital commodity assets. The CFTC must be able to ensure that products offered are suitable, that the barriers to entry are meaningful, and that the disclosure information provided is material to their decision making. <clears throat> the Commission will continue to leverage cloud and other new technology to enhance and transform its ability to collect, analyze, and draw informed conclusions from market and industry data to conduct and support effective enforcement actions, oversee rapidly evolving markets, and formulate sound regulatory policy. As such, the FY24 request includes additional funds to expand the CFTC's ability to keep pace with mission requirements. Looking at our organizational chart, we are lacking not only diversity at our higher ranks, highest ranks, but we are lacking an entire population of entry-level staff members. To resolve this imbalance, I am directing an agency-wide strategic approach to human capital management to better attract, develop, retain, and promote a diverse workforce from all across the country. In support of this plan, I am eager to see the CFTC's OMWI statutorily authorized which is similar to other financial federal regulators. In conclusion, I believe the fiscal year 24 request supports important investments for the agency, our markets, our economy, and national security. It's my goal as chairman to use these resources to address critical needs of the agency that are commensurate to the growth, complexity, and threats to the derivatives markets. I know that I speak for all the commissioners when I thank staff for their commitment to the agency and its mission. And I also want to thank each of my fellow commissioners for their focused efforts and work on behalf of the agency. Thank you, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate your testimony. And again, your entire testimony will be entered into the record. Uh, we're going to start the uh, rounds of questioning. I will, I'll start with that. Uh, <coughs> Chairman Benham, we've seen a, uh, in uh, June of 2022, the CFTC published a request for information to the Federal Register to, quote, better inform its understanding and oversight of climate-related financial risk. The request specifically asked, quote, should registered entities and registrants be required to disclose information relating to greenhouse gas emissions? Now, I, I have to, given what happened with SVB, and the apparent fixation of regulators at the uh, San Francisco Federal Reserve Bank and the California banking regulators on things other than the integrity of the financial system they were regulating. Um, do you have the expertise in your, on your commission to actually do climate policy? Thanks, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I'll say two things in response to that question. First, you know, in, in, in large part, our markets are 
risk management markets. And climate is an integrated part of what producers and end users think about with respect to futures options and swaps. Um, they obviously affect commodity prices in agriculture, energy, and metals. So climate and the evolving climate risks that we're facing today and in the past have all, always impacted commodity prices and derivatives prices. But ultimately, to your point about that request for information, it was exactly that. It was a request for information. And, and my decision-making process on that was to ensure that we were being responsible as regulators to make sure that whatever decisions we make from a policy perspective are informed by our stakeholders and our market participants. So in fact, if we do get responses such as what you believe that we should not or should steer clear away from risk related to climate change, that will be something that we contemplate and consider in our decision making. Well, let, let me drill down on that because I'm not talking about risk related to climate change. I'm saying the request specifically asks, should registered entities and registrants be required to disclose information relating to greenhouse gas emissions? It's not whether or not these, these people took into account the, client, the risk of climate change. It's whether, I don't know, whether they have enough electrical vehicles in their company. I don't know. I mean, what did that, what did that question mean? Well, does the commission really want to, want to require their entities and registrants to disclose information relating to greenhouse gas emissions? I think we, we are I mean, are my farmers and my, my, uh, you know, my meat producers supposed to report the flatulence of their cattle, for heaven's sake? I mean, I don't know what you're drilling down on. Chairman, we're, we are simply asking the constituency, the stakeholders who are a part of our markets, whether or not this is a piece of information they would like to know. And we've seen an increasing demand for commitments to net zero from consumers and from institutions. So this might be a data point that an institution that either invests or, part, or ca allocates capital in, in futures markets or uses a broker or an exchange would like to know whether or not they have a certain level of greenhouse gas emissions. But it was simply that. It was a question to inform and better inform the commission about whether or not this is something that stakeholders in the derivatives uh, industry want to know. So do you believe requiring registered entities to disclose greenhouse gas emissions, including both direct and indirect emissions, may fall under CFTC statutory authority under the Commodity Exchange Act? I, under our, the current Commodity Exchange Act, we do have to provide disclosures, but this may not be within the remit or the, the, the Commodity Exchange Act's requirements. But this is something that we're going to find out. We're going to get feedback, and we're going to see what the legal issues are, what the policy issues are, and what the stakeholders want or don't want. So if your stakeholders, and through this mechanism, they somehow decide that you ought to ask, you know, require registrants to disclose greenhouse gas emissions, you're going to come to this subcommittee and ask for funding to do that? No, not necessarily. Oh, I, I, I certainly hope not, yep. because I think that would be wandering far afield from what your purpose in the regulatory schema is. And that's... You know, that, 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 I'll, I'll, leave that, uh, I'll leave that there. With regard to the offices and staffing, uh, the budget includes over $30 million in bi uh, building rental costs, including payments to the GSA for Kansas City, Chicago, New York offices, payments on a legacy lease for office headquarters here in Washington, D.C. What's the timeline and plan for the CFTC staff to be back in the office full time to actually use those buildings and office space the agency is renting? And uh, again, to the tune of $30 million. Uh, Chairman, we are currently, I am currently negotiating with the bargaining union, and my hope is we are going to move as expeditiously as possible, but I also believe that given what we've been through over the past two or three years, um, we have to be patient and thoughtful about where we were prior to COVID, where we are now, and what a path forward is. So I'm working with the, the bargaining union, and hopefully we're going to get a decision in the near future. So if, if we uh, don't bring workers back into the office, can we expect uh, that you won't need that $30 million in rental? Cost Chairman, if, 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 if certainly if the outcome of the negotiation between me and the bargaining unit is that they're in a full or maximum telework policy, then yes, there okay, would be no reason for rental space. Mr. Bishop. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for your, your testimony. Um, we've heard... Uh, the other side proposed to reduce discretionary funding uh, to at least FY22 levels. And for the FTC, that means a total funding of at most $320 million, which is $91 million less than the FY24 request and $46 million less than your budget for this year. Um, tell me, what would a $45 million budget cut mean for CFTC, and what dangers would that create for the economy? Uh, in FY22, 
uh, CFTC obtained over $2.5 billion in restitution and civil monetary penalties uh, resulting from your enforcement actions. That means that people broke the law and CFTC reduced the deficit in the process. So if the cuts that uh, my Republican friends are proposing are enacted in the law, would CFTC's ability to enforce the law be hampered? And what does that mean? Does that mean that you wouldn't be able to collect as much money uh, in these fines, uh, in enforcement uh, actions, uh, and in the process uh, help reduce the deficit? Uh, thank you, Congressman, for the question. And you know, what we've seen over the past few years is a dr dramatic increase in costs, both because of increased salaries and expenses, but also increased costs related to technology, both software, hardware. We're transitioning to the cloud. Um, these have all contributed to the costs that we're, we're um, taking on right now and, and really resulting in the budget requests. That said, if we were to go back to FY22 levels um, and having done some analysis on this, um, at our current levels, we're about 680 FTE. We'd probably have to drop uh, between 200 and 250 at least FTE um, in some way, shape, or form, and, and either temporary leave or permanent leave, depending on what the funding mechanism was. Um, this would be uh, dramatic, um, have a dramatic impact on the agency's ability to fulfill its mission. And to your point about enforcement, um, surveillance, and market oversight, data protection, cybersecurity protections, these would all be jeopardized. And I think that would be, given the environment we're in right now with volatility in markets, cyber attacks that we're facing, um, and the number of enforcement cases that we're bringing and the amount of money that we're assessing in terms of civil monetary penalties, this would be um, quite dramatic for our ability to fulfill our mission and, and compromise our ability to do what we've been doing over How the past few years. How about market stability? Uh, going back to the question of budget cuts, uh, would those cuts uh, reduce CFTC's ability to ensure market stability? And I mean, absolutely. What risk would that pose yeah, I mean, for, the, for, the, it, for the economy? Having that reduction in full-time staff would essentially eliminate our ability to oversee institutions, which include uh, largest clearinghouses, which have been designated as systemically important. So you can imagine either having to reduce examinations of these institutions reduce examinations of the brokers or the, the trading markets themselves. And without that ability to have a lens into what those registrants and those entities are doing, whether or not they're meeting the core principles, the law and the re regulations of the CFTC, certainly would, uh, without a doubt, impose or at least present some financial stability risk to our markets. Okay, the Dodd-Frank Act brought the swaps market under CFTC's jurisdiction in 2010 dramatically expanding uh, its responsibility to oversee the river's markets. And I know that you were brought in to regulate those markets. Uh, there were growing pains because the commission didn't have all the resources it needed. Uh, if Congress were to grant uh, CFTC jurisdiction over crypto and digital assets markets, how would the scale of that expansion compare to the swap market oversight expansion under Dodd-Frank? Uh, thank you, Congressman. You know, we thought about this a bit, and obviously, given the size of the crypto market relative to the, the swaps market, I think my, my clear um, belief is that what we went through about 10 to 15 years ago in implementing a swaps regime, we could replicate that with the crypto regime. Um, it really is in terms of market structure. Uh, there's analogies to, to be made in terms of registering intermediaries, registering exchanges, registering custodians and other stakeholders or participants in the market. In terms of cost, it would be very difficult to sort of assess and analyze. I've made some statements in the past, and we've done some analogies with the swaps regime, saying that it could be anywhere between 100 and $150 million because of the size of the market and the number of the participants that are in the market. Um, that, that could be an assessment. But I think if we were given cash market authority, uh, we certainly would want to work with all of you to assess the number of registrants and what we would need to do to scale both personnel and hardware in order to regulate the market uh, adequately. Thank you. My time has expired, so I yield back the time I don't have. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you, Mr. Bishop. Mr. Valadeo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate, Chairman, uh, your time being here today. Uh, it's important for us to have these conversations. Um, first, I want to start off with uh, a little bit of, of oversight here. It concerns me that the futures market speculators can have such a dramatic effect on the price of food at the 
at our local farmer's market. Twice since the spring of 2021, corn futures have risen to about 500,000 contracts, or about 62.5 million tons of corn that had yet to be planted. And these artificial spikes in the commodity values have a real domino effect on the cost of food at the grocery store. What systems are in place and what actions are being taken by the CFTC to ensure our American our American farmers and families can purchase the highest quality inputs and produce at the lowest possible cost in the face of such an influential speculator's game. The reason why I ask that question is, is I mean, I traded for a number of years uh, before I was uh, a farmer. I mean, we did some hedging, we worked through our traders, and it always felt like there were a lot of folks out there in the marketplace that moved it around and made it nearly impossible for us as regular, just average farmers to compete <coughs> and play and we would get run over and it would cost us huge sums of money and margin calls. And it was frustrating. And we're always looking for ways for farmers to get involved in this market. But you've got these speculators pushing the prices up, not even just pushing the prices up, creating paper piles of corn that doesn't even really exist or whatever other commodities out there. What are we doing out there to make sure that we protect the ability for farmers to be able to hedge appropriately. Thanks, Congressman. You know, this is a top priority for me and the agency, and given the chairman's point about the roots of this agency in both the U.S. Department of Agriculture but our agriculture constituency, I would say, you know, since 2020 and 2021, we've seen probably record volatility in all of the agricultural and energy and metal complexes because of COVID, because of the Russia-Ukraine crisis, and that return to sort of normal um, and then obviously some of the list logistics issues that we face that have created bottlenecks. Um, but from a market perspective, yes, we have to find the right balance between um, speculators as liquidity providers um, and speculators as a group that is pushing prices outside of the supply demand range. And that is a top priority. We have surveillance um, and market oversight. We have our enforcement ability and enforcement tools. Uh, but what we are doing on a daily basis is monitoring data that we collect. We're working with the exchanges. We are working with our SRO, our self-regulatory organization, the National Futures Association, so that we can detect any fraud or manipulation in the markets that would drive prices outside of supply and demand and prevent that futures price from converging with cash, price, cash prices at expiration. This is obviously very difficult. You and I discussed this. There's a lot of volume and volatility, a lot of new market participants um, today that didn't exist, and it's purely driven by electronic trading. But this is a reason that I focused on data and technology as really the foundational tool for the CFTC to succeed in the future. We have to really rethink how we monitor markets and surveil markets because we are always one step behind the largest financial institutions or largest market participants who will do anything and spend any amount of money to have the slightest bit of edge. So I feel like we're always on our heels, but we are prioritizing it. We're trying to get investments in data, in data technology that will improve surveillance and market oversight. So ultimately that we can bring enforcement actions and send a clear signal to the market that they have to comply with the laws. Have you been able to enforce any actions on anyone? Um, Congressman, last year we brought um, a record case against Glencore uh, over and close to $1.5 billion. They were manipulating um, gas prices um, and at some delivery points in California. Uh, we brought a position limits case against a Chinese agricultural producer, Kafka, last year as well. So we do have several ag-specific um, enforcement matters that I think not only eliminate that bad actor, but send a clear signal for deterrence. Because one of the things that's really difficult is, um, and I did mostly milk, obviously, as a dairy farmer, so it was class three. There were times that we knew what was going on on the farm. We knew the heat was really hard on our cattle. We were down in uh, production. There was no reason for the numbers to be where they were. We knew that the market, we weren't delivering the milk to the market that they were claiming was out there. And, there, and it seemed like the market was going the wrong direction. And all of us were... Uh, watching it closely, watching what was going on our farms, talking to our neighbors, talking to our salesmen, and it was always going the wrong direction. It would end up settling in the right spot, but that ride between the day you hedge and the day that you settle out that contract, those margin calls are, I mean, yep. you sell the farm at that point, and it's frustrating. So it's something that I hope we can continue to work on, but I'm pretty much out of time, so I appreciate uh, your time. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you very much. And uh, voting has started, but I think we'll get two more uh, question questioners in, and then we'll uh, take a recess. Ms. Underwood. 
Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Benham, your agency is one of several federal agencies uh, with authority over digital assets like cryptocurrency. Now, this is a space where we've seen markets balloon and shrink in massive shifts just over the last few years. As digital assets have gone mainstream, so have their customers. And everyday Americans are now buying, selling, and holding crypto like never before. Of course, the CFTC's current authority is tied to fraud and manipulation that's already occurred. And we've seen a lot of both. In a market this volatile, just keeping up with new scams can be half the battle. And as you noted in your testimony, it's striking that more than 20% of your enforcement actions already involve digital currencies. When it comes to fraud and market manipulation of digital assets, what emerging trends and threats have you been seeing in recent months? Thank you, Congresswoman. You know, you pointed this out. The biggest concern I have is the retail-oriented um, nature of the markets and mm -hmm. the speculative nature of the markets. And this is very unique for a commodity market. We are typically a wholesale risk management market, and the fact of the matter is we're seeing technology disrupt financial markets such that your constituents and regular everyday Americans can download an app on their phone transfer some capital from their bank and start trading these commodities um, very easily. And they're speculative, they have high volatility, and there's yeah. a very big chance of losing money. Well, while digital, while digital assets can offer opportunities, they lack basic consumer protections and they come with unprecedented risks, making enforcement an even more important tool to protect consumers. The spending cuts that Republicans are proposing would significantly weaken CFTC's enforcement capabilities. Can you tell us more about how these cuts would affect your ability to protect individual customers in the digital asset space to ensure that those markets can innovate and compete fairly? Yeah, I mean, if we were to have a reduction of budget, all we're seeing right now is increased costs and increased market partic participation, meaning we have more participants in our market, which means we need more boots on the ground because there's just most likely more fraud and manipulation of our mm -hmm. markets. Any cuts would be a disaster to our enforcement program. Um, as you pointed out, we've had record numbers of penalties assessed multiple times our budget. So I've always said that the CFTC is a great return on investment for the American taxpayer. And I would hope, given the cyber issues we're facing, given the growth of retail participation we're seeing, and given the increased cost related to cyber data and data protection, that we collectively have to think about an increased investment in the CFTC because ultimately it's going to protect our financial markets, maintain integrity, mm -hmm. and protect all of the Americans who participate in our markets or use them as a reference for the food that they eat or the, the energy that, that heats their homes and powers their cars. Well, I'm about putting people over politics, and I certainly wouldn't support these kind of cuts, especially that would limit your enforcement authorities to keep consumers safe. Now, understandably, digital assets can be really appealing to communities that have been ignored or failed by traditional financial markets. Young people, for example, who came of age after the 2008 financial crisis have seen the risks that more traditional investments can pose to working families. And from the failure of the Freedman Savings Bank to the discrimination we see in the property appraisals today, we know our financial system has never been set up to serve black Americans in the way that we deserve. Given this history, it's not surprising that young people and communities of color have been interested in investing in digital assets as a means to build wealth. In fact, black Americans are now more likely to own cryptocurrency assets like st than stocks or mutual funds. Big picture, what needs to happen to ensure the markets you oversee are both accessible and fair for these consumers? And how do we help manage risk with policies that address the racial wealth gap instead of making it worse? Congressman, um, we have to educate, and I think this is something that I would like to work with your office on. We have an off Office of Customer Education, and in, in enabling that office to teach and educate the investing public more uh, about things other than fraud and manipulation, I think mm -hmm. would arm these investors with tools so that they can uh, appropriately uh, allocate their capital. But to your point, an unregulated market is going to create risks. It's going to create volatility. And ultimately, I think, you know, what we've seen statistically is that, you know, people are going to end up on the short end of the stick in terms of their, their capital. Well, thank you, Chairman Benham. As policymakers, we have a real responsibility to make sure our hardworking young people and communities of color can build that generational wealth through our financial system, not just those on top. And so I do look forward to working with you to accomplish this mission so that American families can thrive for generations to come. Thanks so much. I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Newhouse. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Ranking Member. Uh, thank you, Chairman uh, Benham, for being here. Um, 
uh, in previous years legislation, this committee asked the CFDC to look at factors affecting the aluminum market. Um, so I've got a couple questions I'd like to ask you about that. First, I need a little education apparently on the aluminum market. Could you help me understand the CFDC's efforts to examine existing market research and data that validates uh, aluminum end users' concerns about market distortions and artificially established prices. And then second, uh, just uh, it, two years ago, uh, DHS Inspector General uh, Kufari raised serious questions regarding aluminum producers charging a tariff-loaded transportation fee on metal that uh, should not have been subjected to Section 232 tariffs. Uh, that same period two years ago, the IG from DHS wrote a letter to you when you were acting chairman. I see you nodding your head. You remember this. And to the end of the Inspector General of the C CFTC, in which it was stated, uh, we learned that private beverage in industry aluminum recyclers and producers may be charging aluminum prices based on the Midwest premium duty paid benchmark, even though the aluminum sold may not be subject to any duties or tariffs. They also stated that they referred this matter to the CFTC for appropriate action. Uh, I've not been able to find any additional actions from the CFTC or the CFTC IG. We do have a staff report, which the committee requested uh, in our uh, fiscal year 22 legislation, which said that uh, CFTC may or may not have the authority over price reporting agencies, but, but we believe you do have that enforcement authority in interstate commerce for manipulative activity, including false uh, reporting and fraud. So. Could you provide me an update that we could share with the committee? Uh, thank you, Congressman. You know, you point out rightfully so, and very familiar with this issue, and something that the commission, um, specifically our, our market experts, have been focused on. Um, ultimately, as, as we have had this discussion about crypto markets, we don't oversee cash markets. We have a limited authority to police a cash market, which is, in, in many respects, um, uh, some of the issues, as you pointed out, the Midwest premium and how it relates to. Um, uh, aluminum at, at the sort of wholesale and retail level. So we have spent um, a, a bit of time and, and, and with, without pause to investigate and to th identify any abnormalities or any issues related to fraud or manipulation. I can't speak to any open um, investigations or enforcement cases right now, but certainly we're aware of these issues. Um, we are monitoring the prices of our derivatives contract. Um, and using every surveillance tool and oversight tool that we have, coupled with our enforcement authority to ensure that we're policing the markets. And if we do identify fraud or manipulation, um, you know, you have my commitment 100%, we will bring a case uh, without question. Uh, but really, it's about making sure that we can identify any uh, anomalies or fraud or manipulation in those underlying markets, which we don't have direct authority over. Just, uh, just to boil it down, I appreciate that, but just trying to figure out why Section 232 tariffs are being applied uh, for domestically produced or recycled aluminum when uh, they should only apply to Im imported aluminum. So somebody's got to have a, a, a be able to resolve this. Yeah, I uh, I can't speak to Section 232 and w why a tariff is being applied or not applied. That's um, certainly outside of the remit of the CFTC. But um, if this is something that we could look into, we will. But um, we do not uh, enforce or impose tariff applications uh, um, out of the CFTC. Then if I could, in the minute I have remaining, it may not be enough, but in your response to, to Congressman Bishop, uh, you talked about having to, if we went back to fiscal year 22 levels of, of funding, you'd have to lose 200 to 250 FTEs. We're just finishing up fiscal year 23, that, does that mean you brought on 250 people in that in that one? No, time Congressman, period? it's a good question. We've just seen um, significant price increases, both from a salary and expensive perspective, where we would traditionally see two percent. We're seeing five to ten percent, and then we have a number of contracts where very data heavy and very hardware and software heavy, including transitioning to the cloud. So a lot of our costs are related to technology, and we've just seen a huge spike in those costs relative to what we've seen in the past. And we had been flat funded or close to 
flat funded for a number of years uh, over the past decade, and we've been trying to get into a routine of um, engaging with longer term contracts. And as we've had short term contracts expire, these longer term contracts have imposed significant costs that we have to um, we have to engage in because otherwise we would really not be meeting our mission. But if we do go back to 22 levels, finding areas to cut would be Safe. difficult and um, the FTE would be an area that would actually be impacted quite significantly. I appreciate the clarification. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. At this time, we do have votes on the floor, so the subcommittee will stand in recess. We'll resume questions immediately following the votes about 2.15 uh, p.m.
Subcommittee will come to order. Mr. Klein. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, good to see you. I uh, want to talk about crypto. Um, last week, the Biden administration released their annual Council of Economic Advisors report, which had a, lar a large section dedicated to crypto. And the report repeatedly bashed the promise of crypto and largely viewed it through the lens of frauds like Sam Bankman Fried of FTX. Um, it also ran counter to the executive order from the White House last year on crypto and some previous statements that you've made on the technology. In your view, uh, why has the tone shifted in the administration on crypto to nearly writing the industry off as a scam? And do you believe there remains potential and actual utility? Uh, and if so, why do you think your colleagues over at the SEC or CEA say otherwise? Thanks, Congressman. Um, you know, unfortunately, I can't speak for the drafting of that document or why it was um, written the way it was. But certainly, um, as I've said before, and, and you alluded to this, um, I very much focus on the market's perspective and what my responsibility of, uh, of overseeing markets as chair of the CFTC is. And what we've seen over the past better part of a decade is an emerging market that um, has commodity digital tokens being traded by retail participants in a speculative manner, um, and, and that calls for, I think, cl clear oversight and regulation. So from my perspective, it's about protecting customers, protecting market stability and resilience, um, and regardless of what may or may not happen in terms of technology and how it's utilized in our economy or commerce, um, I think is outside of, uh, of my purview, per se, just because I'm really focused on markets and customer protections and market resiliency. Well, in the past, you've said that the U.S. should have a clear framework to regulate crypto to promote innovation while also protecting consumers, and that's a view I, I share. Uh, now, since you last testified, a report revealed the U.S. has already lost its lead for blockchain development, going from 40 percent to just 29 percent of the market. And this innovation flight is concerning, and we can't just sit idly by and let other countries or potential adversaries lead in what many refer to as the next version of the Internet. How do you... Uh, view that and do you think we can change course and in, is innovation a flight of concern for uh, you and other regulatory counterparts in the administration? Yeah, I mean, speaking for myself, uh, it should it should be absolutely a concern and I, I, I do balance that against um, who are we competing against, right? And I think when I had this conversation years ago with some of your colleagues, maybe some smaller jurisdictions that were trying to get a few steps ahead uh, and to create economic development or, or um, uh, a new workforce, that's fine. But what we are seeing is um, Western economies, Europe has, has put in place a pretty comprehensive regime that's going to be implemented over the next couple years. And I think it's important that we as a country, both from a economic perspective, from a labor perspective, from a technology perspective, and national security perspective, that we move the ball forward, right? We don't want to rush. We want to be cautious and deliberate in what we do and how we do it. But creating rules of the road will certainly protect customers. But it will also open up an avenue to identify whether or not there is promise to this innovation and technology. Now, just getting a little more specific, yesterday in an enforcement action against Binance, your agency once again highlighted that the FTC, CFTC believes Ethereum is a commodity. However, the Biden administration's SEC has been saying that Ethereum is a security that not only counters your agency's view, but also the previous SEC leadership's view. I've heard from crypto companies that regulatory clarity is needed to create a robust regulatory framework, but it seems like the relative agencies are at odds not only on Ethereum, but crypto regulation as a whole. Can you talk about the SEC's position on Ethereum in particular being counter to yours, and how do we bridge the gap to make sure the U.S. has comprehensive and clear regulation for crypto to ensure innovation thrives while also protecting consumers? Thanks, Congressman. You know, I'll focus on the fact that we've had um – listed uh, futures on a CFTC regulated markets going back to 2017. First Bitcoin, but then Ethereum a few years later. And since then, the, the contracts have traded well. They've been under CFTC oversight. And just by virtue of these contracts being listed on CFTC exchanges, uh, in my view, and I've said this many times, I believe they're a commodity. And because they are listed on CFTC exchanges, we do have a regulatory relationship, obviously with the derivatives market and that product but the underlying market as well, which is why we're bringing cases, including the ones you mentioned with Binance yesterday, against institutions or organizations that are trading Bitcoin or Ethereum. Well, I do think that uh, legislation to address the issue should place regulatory authority with the CFTC. I think uh, you'll see broad and deep support for that uh, 
that method of uh, regulation, and, and I urge my support for that as well. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Ms. Henson. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Chairman Benham, thank you for coming before our committee. I think it goes without saying that the CFTC plays a very important role in helping a lot of Iowans in, in the work that you do to regulate uh, markets and uh, mitigate risk as well. So I want to touch on um, cybersecurity to start. Um, it's a, a serious threat facing our critical industries, as you know, and a shared priority. I think it's really important that our financial markets are protected from these risks and threats. So um, I was certainly encouraged by your testimony that it is a, a top priority for you at, um, at CFTC. Can you uh, elaborate a little bit on any emerging threats that you might be seeing right now or trends, um, anything that you are specifically doing to counter these cyber threats. Thanks, Congresswoman. Yeah, um, as you pointed out, this is top of the list in terms of what we are thinking about at the agency to protect the agency. And I'll, I'll point out one data point, which is always shocking to me, even as it rolls off my tug, but we face 800 million events per day. And an event is defined as an effort to sort of penetrate the CFTC's network. So I'll repeat that, 800 million a day. Um, and this is because financial markets and CFTC markets are critical infrastructure for not only Iowans, but also our national security and our economy. So um, we have to be uh, well-resourced. We have to have the right personnel, which is increasingly challenging in this labor market, but with what we're competing against in the private sector. Um, and ultimately making sure our direct registrants are elevating themselves to make sure they have the best cyber t protections that comply with our law. Mm -hmm. I will say, uh, before I turn back to you, third-party service providers or vendors is also another huge issue that we're facing right now. We had a cyber attack against uh, a vendor, a third-party service provider in early February called ION, UK-based entity, but a lot of our registrants had used this entity, which was essentially a back office um, uh, settlement, uh, among other things, uh, company. And for the period of almost six to eight weeks, we had to delay a report that we put out on data in our markets. But it is a single point of failure that could cause and wreak havoc across financial markets and end up delaying, obviously, reports, but disrupting markets. So um, there are a lot of bad actors. There are nation states. There are individuals who are doing everything they can to penetrate our markets and to bring them down. Um, and I think this is why it's so important that we have the right personnel and resources to protect our markets. Yeah, we actually just had Director Easterly with CISA um, in this very room earlier today um, talking about some of those threats from um, these nation states and bad actors. So I'd be interested to know, just for follow-up, and you can get me this information later, uh, any cooperation between your agency and CISA, what you're doing to um, be proactive there. I mean, 800 million is a pretty staggering number. Um, wanted to quick touch on in the remaining time I have left uh, carbon markets. Um, obviously, farmers across Iowa are, are looking at this as a potential opportunity for reward for them for um, in a voluntary capacity uh, for things that they're doing, obviously, to be uh, good stewards, good management practices of their land. Um, so can you discuss a little bit some of the opportunities that might exist um, in this space and where you see CFTC's role um, as the carbon markets kind of continue to emerge? Yeah, I mean, we're seeing, it's a great question, Congresswoman. It, we're seeing these markets grow and scale and with demand from institutions and, and companies and individuals to uh, sort of hit net zero targets, they're using these offsets, these carbon offsets as a tool to meet those goals. <clears throat> for landowners, whether it's farmers, ranchers, or any other landowners, this is a, you know, a really good opportunity to create a new revenue stream. But ultimately, and I've said this before, um, as we think about policies or programs to set up registries that set standards for how we're going to issue the certificates and what standards a landowner might need to meet to say that they're sequestering X amount of tons of carbon, you're creating a marketplace, um, and you're creating uh, a marketplace that needs rules of the road and transparency. And, and we've dealt with this in the past. I brought up the, the example of the renewable fuel standard and the RINs market that was developed on the back end of that. So what we have here is a commodity market because the carbon offsets can and should be defined as commodities under the Commodity Exchange Act and the potential for a secondary market developing. And uh, not unlike the crypto conversation, this is a product of technology and a product of access to financial markets. Um, and as we see these commodity instruments, in this case, the carbon offsets being traded potentially, I think it's important for a market regulator to be involved. And we have this anti-fraud and manipulation authority over cash markets. 
Um, and this is a perfect example of an area that I've said publicly, if we do or hear about fraud or manipulation in these carbon offset markets, we will certainly be aggressive in bringing an enforcement action. And ultimately, bringing a regulator into the conversation brings integrity, deters bad conduct and misconduct, and it levels the playing field. If we have a level playing field and a market with integrity, I think your constituents will feel more confident in you know, setting aside some land, sequestering carbon through cover crops or new plantings or forest, and then ultimately being able to generate new revenue. Yeah, well, we say this all the time. Our farmers are the best stewards of their land, and they are willing to try. Um, they just need a, as you said, level playing field. So yeah. I'm encouraged by those comments and appreciate you being here today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Franklin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Benham, uh, just yesterday, the CFTC uh, sued crypto exchange uh, Binance and its founder on allegations that the company knowingly offered unregistered crypto derivatives uh, in the U.S. against U.S. federal law. Uh, Binance, as we know, is a Chinese company. Uh, they also have uh, were found to have shared sensitive client data with the Russian government back in 2021. I doubt you can elaborate much on that case since it's ongoing. If, if you could, that, I'd, I'd love to hear that. But also, just broader than that, can you can you discuss how the CCP uh, is, is attempting to skew our derivatives markets, and then what is CFTC doing to try to thwart those efforts? Uh, thank you, Congressman. On the case, you're right, I can't speak too much about it, but enough um, to share with you this was an incredibly important case that we brought, both sending a signal here in the U.S., but overseas, that if you are going to offer derivatives to U.S. investors, you must register with the CFTC. Um, and in this case, Binance, the largest derivatives exchange in the world, uh, we have documentation of a willful uh, desire to avoid CFTC law and our rules um, around uh, compliance with the, with the regulations and specifically penetrating um, the, the U.S. market through creating a virtual private network or a VPN. Um, so as we see this ongoing violation of the Commodity Exchange Act, we thought it was imperative uh, to move as quickly as possible to not only assess a civil monetary penalty, disgorgement of revenue, uh, potentially a trading ban, um, but also a permanent injunction on that activity. Um, in terms of what we're seeing with uh, China, um, you know, it is an area that obviously is a huge trading partner for our, uh, our American farmers and ranchers, but one that I would say um, is developing a futures market and a derivatives market. So I would um, certainly look forward to working with you on thinking about what that might mean in the years and decades to come. I think it's important um, that we have the strongest, most robust, most desirable derivatives markets here in the U.S., in Chicago, New York, uh, and in, in Atlanta. Um, and I think with that, it becomes important for all of us collectively to think about what we need to do to maintain uh, that status because that has downward effects on the dollar as a reserve currency and being able to price commodities in the dollar. And we've seen since COVID transactions in major commodities and other currencies. And I think this could have a potential impact on the U.S. economy, you know, down the road years and in decades to come. So I think this is the right time to be thinking about questions like the one you just asked to ensure we remain and uh, preserve our dominance from a U.S. financial perspective. Um, this question is regarding the CFTC's core principle eight, uh, which states that a designated contract market shall make public daily information on settlement prices, volume, open interest, and opening and closing ranges for actively traded contracts on the contract market. More and more, we're seeing big exchanges put this kind of information behind paywalls, uh, including some of the like historically uh, daily settlement information. How is CFTC ensuring that basic market data from these exchanges, including all this historic da historical data, is being made available to the public? Uh, Senator, uh, Congressman, it's a good question. And I, I think it's important that we balance between um, our role as a regulator to ensure that information uh, is flowing to market participants and the general public so that they can make more informed decisions. Uh, but there is a commercial element to this as well, where the designated contract market, as you said, um, is able to aggregate, collect data, and then um, essentially um, use it as a, as a revenue tool through, through sale. So um, we need to make sure, and we do have provisions in the Commodity Exchange Act to ensure that there are, any, there are no anti-competitive behaviors or any um, actions taken by a registrant that would uh, distort markets, whether it's supply and demand, or create um, a, sort of a, a barrier for market participants and the public to collect data that should be public information. But um, I'd, I'd like to potentially take that back and see if there's something that we can do, and certainly we'll reach out to your office and see if there's something that we can share with you. 
I appreciate that. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much. Um, I do have a couple of uh, questions. I'll yield myself some time, and I'll yield you some time, Mr. Bishop, if you have some follow-up questions. I, I have three. First of all, with regards to what I've asked you before about the climate-related financial risks, I just need to know, how many people did you have reviewing uh, those answers to your, to your uh, request for information? How many employees? Uh, we, I think, approximately uh, 10 employees. 10 but employees. I can get you a okay. n definite number. All right. And this was not their exclusive responsibility. They were well, what, what FTE? What's, what full-time equivalents? So I would say 10. 10, but, but, but you said this, that oh, wasn't the only an, thing that did. So how many FTEs? FTE, that's right. How many FTEs? It would be a fraction of an FTE in terms of hours. And how many questions did you get? How many answers did you get? We got those? 80 responses. Oh, that's it, 80. Okay, yeah, you, I can believe that's only part of an FTE. Let me follow up a little about Mr. Newhouse's question about, you know, if you if you got frozen where you are, you know, you'd lose like or 22 levels, you'd, you'd have to fire like 250 people. And he, he, I guess he kind of implied, he didn't understand the math, but you suggested that there are some long-term contracts that are in place that would require you to lay off or, or let people go because you have to, perform on these contracts? Is that why that number of employees seemed a little high? No, I, I well, I think in part, uh, Chairman, that is a reason because we enter into long-term contracts for a number of services for the agency. But I do also believe that um, if we were to go to 22 levels, given where we were in FY22 and what we're requesting right now, it would be a significant um, hit to the agency and we would have to drop upwards of 250 FTE. So are your cloud migration contracts long-term contracts? Um, I do not. I can get that. I can if, get if the you answer. get back, yeah. I appreciate yeah. that. And I just want to follow up on one thing. Uh, again, something that you brought up with, with Ms. Hinson about, you know, wanting to make sure your regulated entities have cyber protection and things like that. Well, when you testified earlier this month before the Senate Agriculture Committee, you, you explained that you would like to see the Office of Minority and Women Inclusion authorized, statutorily authorized, so it would allow you to, quote, assess the diversity policies and practices of entities regulated by the agency. Now, I can see where the average American says, yeah, I, th I think it's right. CFTC, they ought to be making certain your regulated entities have cyber protection policies. They ought to make certain they're playing by the rules. But how in the world would the diversity policy and practice of entities regulated by the agency uh, how is that critical to the integrity of the derivatives market? Because that's, that's your, go your sole purpose is to make sure that derivatives market is, is, has integrity. How does no having that information about your regulated entities play into that? I just can't, for the life of me, I can't understand. I, I fully understand why you might be doing it, the pressures to do it, same pressures the Federal Reserve Bank in San Francisco had, the California regulators had before the SBV collapse, same pressures. Connect the dots for me. Chairman, we, I, I mentioned this earlier. We have uh, unfortunately suffered from um, uh, budget challenges over several years. And I think, and, I, and thanks to you and your colleagues over the past few fiscal years, our budget has gone up significantly and it has enabled us to do our job successfully. And I think our track record speaks for that. But for those few years, and this was probably in the FY17 to 20, 21 period, we were close to flat funded. And that coming in in this role as acting chair and chair is clear has had long-term and will have long-term impacts on the success of the agency. It affects our ability to recruit. It affects attrition rates. It affects morale at the agency. So when I made that statement, and I want to be very clear, what I've asked our OMWI office to do and our HR office to do is to recruit broadly across the country. I said that in my opening statement. So this is not just about... Um, historically black colleges and universities. This is about land-grant universities. This is about rural America. This is about getting ag economists and experts across the country that will help the CFTC improve its ability to do its job and be more representative of the people we work for. And to your question, we recruit from these institutions. We recruit from these financial institutions. We recruit from universities. We recruit from different areas. And I think it's important that if we have a diverse workforce, that are specializing in the derivatives markets, it will enable the CFTC to be better staffed in the future. So the, the, the plain letter understanding of what you said is not true, that you don't want to assess the diversity policies and practices of entities regulated by the agency. You want to create diversity within your agency, but this says you want to assess the policies of regulated entities. And that's the connection I, I just don't understand. What difference does, if they're conducting their business according legally, 
with no problems, why would you want to delve into their diversity policies? I, Chairman, again, I, if you don't mind, I'm gonna. I would just want to take a. Uh, I, I want to take a look at that and okay. make sure. I because said, it is a 2.4 million, 2.5 million dollar budget item. I understand, and I understand, and I, I just want to. Okay. I want to make sure that um, what I said is in context and exactly that, um, and and we'll get you. back to you. And I'll yeah. yield to Mr. Bishop. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Benham. Uh, during the last CFTC hearing that we had, I asked Chairman Giancarlo about the agency's efforts to diversify its workforce. And uh, I'd like to get an update from you now. Uh, last year, I believe you were appointed Tanisha Cole Edmonds as the first uh, Chief Diversity Officer in the agency's history. Uh, can you tell us what other progress you've made to increase diversity at the CFTC since 2019? And uh, what are your plans to keep building a diverse workforce moving forward? And why is it important that you have a diverse workforce? Uh, thank you, Congressman. Um, you know, as I pointed out, and as you mentioned, I, I appointed um, our first chief diversity officer, and I felt like we needed leadership there in that position to essentially help support the divisions in their recruitment and um, uh, the way we uh, reach out to universities and different employees to see the type of people we're recruiting. As I mentioned, we have had challenges with our budget, which has meant direct challenges with our staffing. And uh, we tend to be very monolithic in our um, staff. And that I, I don't mean anything bad. We have an amazing staff. But I do think given our constituency, and what I mean by that is the people we represent, which is all Americans, whether it's farmers and ranchers or individuals in urban America, um, finance, um, manufacturing. And my goal to use this chief diversity officer position is to cast as wide a net as possible across the country so that we can recruit experts in all aspects of our market. Um, we are very top heavy because we had many years where we were not able to hire on a consistent basis. So we find ourselves with a lot of senior level folks. Um, and I want to start, as I mentioned in my statement, to get more entry level uh, individuals so that we can build a bench and have a more progressive growth um, process for, for staff at the CFTC. And I just think it's extremely important that we uh, are represented, the agency itself is representative of the people we work for. Um, and I, I think the, the chief diversity officer is playing a role in that. We've reached out to land grant universities across the country. We've reached out to HBCUs. And we're just trying to get the message out about the CFTC and what so, we do. So what you're saying is that uh, the diversity that you are looking for is not necessarily uh, one dimensional. It's not just racial, it's not just gender, uh, it's not just national origin, uh, but it's uh, a totality of the, uh, the broad uh, representation of interests uh, that, that, that your, your agency uh, uh, has stakeholders from. And our country, sir. I mean, that's just the bottom line. And I, I travel across the country, um, Northwest, Midwest, Southeast, and, and I, you know, I see the people that we represent and that Your touch our markets. Diversity. 100%. You know, I spent the last summer in the Northwest in Montana and North Dakota, South Dakota and Washington. And, you know, you see the types of people that use our markets for price discovery, use our markets for risk management, and they rely on them. And those are the types of people that I want to know about the CFTC and maybe one day work at the CFTC. Thank you. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. And, uh, uh, Chairman Benner, I want to thank you for being here today. You've got your work cut out for you. Let me tell you. I mean, it's a, uh, it's a, you know, it's a tough business. Uh, you regulate, and it's a, and it's a growing business. And and as I think you pointed out today in your testimony, the people who would uh, conduct their business improperly are probably always a step ahead, and you're always having to play catch up. Anyway, I think our discussion touched on many important issues, and I look forward to a productive and, and a transparent working relationship with you and your agency as we uh, move through the fiscal year 24 process. As a reminder, if members would like to submit questions for the record, submit those to the subcommittee staff within seven days. The subcommittee stands adjourned.